Is there something in the human mind that can reach out thousands of miles to guide archaeologists to unknown buried ruins? Can ordinary people free some part of themselves to roam beyond the confines of time and space, accurately describing places and details they could not know with their intellect or normal senses? For parapsychologist Stephen Schwartz, such questions are a part of everyday life. As director of the Mobius Society, a Los Angeles-based academic foundation, he has spent years exploring the outer limits of the human mind. I think the argument over whether or not the psychic exists has been settled. There's been 50 years of research. And there's nothing weird about this. It seems to be normal and human. Each of us seems to possess some kind of psychic ability. I think the question now is not in proving it, but in finding out what use we can make of it. In archaeology, the primary challenge is not what is it, but where is it, where to dig. For Schwartz and the Mobius Society, much of their research is devoted to this dilemma. This film chronicles their Egyptian research, the Alexandria Project, a survey by psychic archaeology that became the most ambitious psychic experiment ever conducted. Schwartz chose 11 psychics and sent each one a list of questions and a map of Alexandria. He asked them to locate and describe a wide range of targets, hoping their responses could solve mysteries reaching back 2,000 years. The primary targets were the tomb of Alexander the Great, the library of the ancient city, and the palace where Mark Anthony made love to Cleopatra and later committed suicide. My hope was that a number of people would mark the same locations and that we'd have a consensus in their descriptions about the targets as well. From the 11, Schwartz selected two psychics well-suited to make further predictions once they were on site in Egypt. One was photographer Hella Hammond, who had never been to Alexandria and knew nothing of its obscure history. But in five years of laboratory testing in the U.S., she had demonstrated an extraordinary ability to describe unknown distant targets. People think of a psychic as somebody who's wearing a turban and uh, has a crystal ball. I don't think of myself as a psychic. I'm a photographer, and I've been very interested in psychic functioning. And um, I guess I've spent a lot of time trying to learn how to be more receptive and more tuned to that other world that exists. I just sort of look at the map not as much with my eyes as sort of get the feeling of it. And I tend to feel a heaviness in certain areas. The second psychic was a Canadian working man, George McMullen. In field experiments conducted by archaeologists from McMaster's University and the University of Toronto, he had located and discovered Indian petroglyphs and accurately described and staked out Iroquois Indian villages, which were then excavated. Like Hammond, he knew nothing about Alexandria and was not a professional psychic. In recording his impressions, George reached out with some part of his consciousness to answer the questions. Uh, it's, it's still pretty hard to pinpoint an exact area on this map. So I'm looking through 30 feet of living. And uh, I'll have to just mark a general area uh, where I believe Alexander uh, was uh, finally buried. A consensus did emerge. Analysis revealed that not only did the 11 psychics tend to pick the same areas, they also reported similar images. Basically, the process is like journalism and detective work. We ask people what they see. They don't all agree, of course, but when something turns up again and again, the perceptions tend to be accurate. For Alexandria, I was surprised the psychics were drawn not only to sites on land, but also to several underwater ones in the harbor. They described tunnels, underground structures, and even things to guide us on top of the ground. My judgment was it was worth the risk. We should go and dig. But I gotta tell you, most people thought it was an incredible long shot. Along the shores of the Mediterranean lies an Islamic metropolis. Four and a half million people living at the top of the African continent. But beneath this skin lie 2,200 years of history and thousands of unsolved puzzles. Under the apartment buildings, schools, and shops lie other cities. History peels back to reveal tantalizing bits of the city founded by Alexander the Great 300 years before Christ. 
it was a city of ease and luxury whose tombs still bear mute witness to its wealth. Its citizens have become myths. Caesar, Euclid, Archimedes, Mark Anthony, and his queen and lover, Cleopatra. One of the reasons I was drawn to Alexandria was that for over a thousand years it had been the center of the world west of China. And yet when I tried to look into it, there was almost nothing about where things were in the ancient city. And as a parapsychologist, I was fascinated by the joining of the two major parts of human consciousness. The intellectual age of Greece had married the intuitive pharaonic East, and from that marriage had come a culture that was unique in history. Modern construction has entombed unknown antiquities, and even today, known sites are being lost to the rising water table. It may soon be too late to ask where to dig. And new harbor installations threaten mysteries as yet undiscovered. There was a lot of pressure. No one had ever tried something like this before, and I was kind of anxious. What if the psychics couldn't do it? What if they couldn't do it while they were being filmed? in the hassle of the city. To Schwartz's relief, the psychic soon adjusted to the camera. On her first day out, Hella stopped the car and scurried through a park to a decrepit building that to everyone's frustration was locked and deserted. It took several days to gain access, but finally the caretaker and the key were located. Down there? Okay. Hella was unsure what had drawn her out of the car and through the park. Still, she felt the need to sit quietly inside the building. They hoped further perceptions would come, providing details that could be verified. What I'd like you to do is, again, is try to get your impressions that you're picking up okay. in this area, okay? I keep getting, you know, these underground passages like crazy. I mean, just multi-level. Um, uh, ah, I think, I think there's a river or a, can a canal, uh, you know, mm -hmm. some, um, not a natural waterway, but something that's been, that's been channeled definitely water running underground with these galleries going off it. I mean, the whole thing is surrounded by stone and um, it's definitely designed. It's not, it's not a natural waterway. It was amazing the way the details spilled out of Hella, but were they true? That was the question. I asked her to draw it because with her photographer's eye, frequently her drawings are her most accurate perceptions. And there's water in there? Just in that lower, that lower part. It's like the water's been channeled down there, and then, you know, the rest is galleries and, and, mm -hmm. and archways. It's like, mm -hmm. it really looks like a honeycomb. When the Mobius team checked with the director of the city's museum, they learned that such a cistern had been reported some 200 years earlier by scientists accompanying Napoleon. But the site had been sealed for decades, and no one currently doing research had ever been inside. Even the original entrance had been forgotten. It seemed this detailed perception might be a blind alley. Pursuing their search, the Mobius team met archaeologist Mike Rajevich at the University of Warsaw. He had been excavating in Alexandria for almost 20 years and is acknowledged to be the leading authority on the city's archaeology. He agreed to serve as a consultant to evaluate whatever the psychics discovered. As they continued their other work, the group waited for word of the cistern entrance. But as the weeks passed, they began to give up on the idea of ever being able to check Hammond's perceptions. Then the museum announced they had found the entrance, the original shaft through which slaves entered to clean the structure. A very large cistern-type room or building. It seems to have ledges sort of midway up all around. It's almost like a dungeon. 
It was like moving in time, our feet following those slaves of a millennium before. And even that feeling was overpowered because Hella's accuracy just stunned us. Definitely water running underground with these galleries going off it. I mean, the whole thing is surrounded by stone and uh, it's definitely designed. It's not, it's not a natural waterway. Hella was even correct about the level of the water. For the drawings made before coming to Egypt, they reversed the process. Hella had submitted a seemingly vague perception associated with the ancient city's library. Schwartz asked her to lead the group to the matching site. For several hours, they drove the city. Hey, um, can we go back to that thing there? Yeah. I saw something. I don't know. I had a very funny feeling. Okay. We were hot and tired, and all the streets had started to run together. This one, the driver thought, was probably called Nebby Daniel. I just saw something there. That, yeah. That, yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't see. I had a feeling. I just got this feeling. I couldn't see very much. Wow. You know, that is exactly like my drawing. Remember that, that one here? Like this? Oh, yeah. You know, I, I told you that I had these converging things right. with, with uh, rubble in the middle, and then I told you about the, that I had this, these support hey, scaffolding. There's something and, else there. There it is. Fallen support beams yeah. over underground sewers. My God, that's it. Nothing could be seen from the car, yet Hammett had felt that down the street lay a site matching her drawing. But was it merely a disregarded alleyway? Ooh. I don't know what to say about that. I don't either. I don't think I've ever seen <laughs> uh, Ooh. Mobius later learned that the adjoining mosque had a tradition of having been built on what had once been a place of great learning. Was that the library? There was no way to know without tearing down the mosque, and that was impossible. But what was important was that if Hella was right, then the tomb of Alexander should be nearby. Psychic perceptions of George McMullen on Nebby Daniel Street, 10 April 1979. The voices are Stephen Schwartz and George McMullen. Ready to go, George? Right on the side, Mark. Go. On this side? Right. We're going to have to cross on the other side there. You want to cross over? You want to cross this one? Feel like a good area? It's uh, but it's uh, it's a pretty hot area. Let's put it that way. It seems to have something in here. What do you think? Yeah, it's about the place right here. <laughs> Not uh, right here. See him down there? Look down in there. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you see when you look down there? A broken piece of marble, rubble. Yeah. Uh, pretty well compacted. Just a jumble of, of uh, pieces of rubble, like you'd see if you look down Mm -hmm. Back through there on the yeah, side Yeah, under that pile of dirt and garbage that you see laying there. That's uh, exactly what you see. But there's more to it than that, you know. What was it originally? Uh, it was a tomb. Okay. In a building. Is there is there a uh, body still there? No. No body. No body. Uh, George made it seem easy, but listening to him for an hour, I realized how hard it was to move back 2,000 years. And uh, right behind this wall, about 20 feet to 25 feet down, is where Alexander was buried. And that is Alexander the Great. You're sure of that? I'm positive. I've never been more positive. Alexander the Great is down there. That's right. That's extraordinary. <laughs> I kept the psychics isolated, but this was too exciting a secret to keep. I was afraid if I didn't get Hella right away to Nebby Daniel that she'd hear about it. 
That afternoon, I told her only that George thought this was an important site. Well, the first thing that comes up is um, a very large kind of area, slightly underground, which has supporting arches, a whole lot of supporting arches all over. Mm -hmm. Not a mosque, but a sort of a flat, open area. Under it, mm -hmm. going deep down, I don't know, 20, 30 feet, there is this big kind of a dungeon or a tomb. It's about eight to 10 feet square, and it's about, I don't know, 12 feet high. And uh, it's full of, oh, well, it's not full of it, but about two-fifths of it is that really, really fine dust. Can you show me where yeah. it is? Yeah, I want to show you. It's um, about, I would say, about here, okay? Mm -hmm. And that the, the corner goes right about here. That okay. Goes, you know, the way down here. How so, far down? Huh? Well, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's about at the sixth or seventh of one of these things here, mm -hmm. okay? Right down. Helen and George's agreement electrified us. We'd stayed up most of that night talking about it and decided we had to try to dig at Nebi Daniel. An archaeologist from the university, Fauzi Fakharani, had been recommended to me and I contacted him. He took us to a crypt beneath the mosque and agreed that the tomb of Alexander might be nearby. This mosque is called the Mosque of the Prophet of Nebi Daniel. Mm -hmm. The word Nebi Daniel is a Jewish name. It's not a Muslim name. So, as a matter of fact, that shows clearly that this one is one of the oldest mosques we have in Alexandria because we knew that many synagogues and many churches have been altered to mosques. This mosque, uh, through a, a long period, was connected with another mosque called the Mosque of Zulkarnain. Zulkarnain means the one with two horns, a nickname for Alexander the Great. Since in Muslim tradition, you have a saint under the mosque named after him. So that's why they thought that the uh, burial place of Alexander was under his mosque. Fakharani was intrigued by the psychic perceptions, and he said he'd supervise a trial dig. But he wanted to go through the crypt wall under the mosque. I asked the psychics if this way was better than the one outside that they had both chosen. Building. Building. Uh -huh. But to go down, and all you'd have to do is about a, a four square feet and to get down and then bring your shaft in from the bottom. You mean from the outside? Yeah, from the, uh, the walk. Helen, what do you think is behind the wall? It's another wall. Another wall? And some debris. That there are two walls up there. I, I don't know why, I just think there's another wall. You think there's a wall and debris and another wall? Mm-hmm. Two walls. I wanted to try another approach, but Fakharani insisted. He felt we were closer to the level of the tomb. A first hole revealed nothing but rubble, as George had predicted, so we tried a second hole. The Nebi Daniel trial dig had proven psychically accurate, but further excavation could require tearing down part of the mosque. For the moment, Hammond and McMullen's predictions would remain unproven. Blocked at Nebi Daniel, Schwartz proposed to Fakharani a psychic exploration at a less populated area of Fakharani's choosing. The archaeologist agreed, but the skeptic in him seemed eager to show that such successes could not happen again. The target would be Maria, a buried city 40 kilometers into the Egyptian desert. It's really preposterous, if you think about it, asking somebody to locate a buried building in the middle of the desert. But George seemed to get his bearings after a few hours and make a connection. You, you were digging here. I will take you. If it is the right place, yeah. you tell me it is the right is place. Is that not where you dig? If it is not the right pun, is that not... George described the city's location, and when they arrived, Fakharani gave him his final challenge. <laughs> a nice, important building with spectacular, you know, uh, remains. Spectacular. Tile remains. or mosaic. But, but uh, any, you know. Nicely decorated or statues or whatever it is. You know, something representative. Or a tomb. 
Some from right of the center. See, there weren't much In the area, you shoot. can walk around as you like. Yeah. But it is for you to indicate for me where to dig. OK. <laughs> you want to try that? <laughs> I walk this wall a little here. You're walking over a wall? Yeah, I'm almost a wall. While Fakarani previously had excavated low structures at Maria, George's answer to his challenge led them away to an untouched site. Here, this? Yeah, how about right about it? After McMullen left, Hammond came to the Helltop site he had chosen. His process had extended nearly the whole day, and Hammond was now ill and tired from waiting in the sun. She was given no information beyond the general Helltop location. Now take me a minute. For the next hour, Hammett answered questions and volunteered details that could be dug up and proven, or used by Fakarani to discredit the method. It's the northwest corner. I think it's about, you know, about here, this mm -hmm. way. I seem to see, um, I don't know whether it's a statue or a column, a freestanding object that stands sort of in the middle of this room or alcove or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. It's either a broken statue. It doesn't. It doesn't feel like it's something that's in one piece, mm -hmm. or a broken column, pillar. That's mm -hmm. round. Hella and George had been very specific. There was a lot to test. The Byzantine building, its exact outline, its doorways, the depth at which its walls would emerge, Hella's broken column, and the marble mosaic floor. George saw floor two, but then no floor. He couldn't explain that. Fakarani disagreed or dismissed every one of these predictions, quoting an earlier electronic survey that had shown that there was nothing there. And if there was something there, he said, it would be Roman. There you go. This, that we're looking this at. the wall. Under Fakarani's direction, scraping away the centuries would take six weeks, and he cheerfully predicted failure. But he could not refute their first success just six days into the dig. Two days later, the top of a strange broken column emerged. Hella had a hit. It turned out to be a primitive form of Bedouin oven never before seen in Maria. Three days after that, George's fire pits were found. By now it was sure the building was Byzantine and not Roman as Fakarani had claimed. As work progressed, McMullen continued to offer predictions. George still couldn't explain to me about the floor or no floor, but in one session he gave me a drawing of some small marble tiles that were smooth on one side and rough on the other. The chalk subflooring was all that was left. The main floor had been stripped away centuries ago when the building was abandoned. But a few small marble discs were hidden in the debris. McMullen's description seemed correct, but we needed verification from a third party. Here's what to analyze the tile prediction and other data from Maria, Mobius turned to Brzejevich and the Secretary General of the Archaeology Society, Professor Daoud. Now we found a number of them. These are just, these are just two. They are representative, however, of the, of the lot. Are they weights or something? They can be. There's one possibility that they, are, they are used, were used as weights, and the second is that they were used as the cubes, or instead of cubes, in the mosaics, in the pavements. So you feel it not unreasonable to think they're mosaics? Are mosaics. That's the most reasonable explanation for this. Maria had succeeded beyond anything hoped for. In the exploration of the human mind, it was a unique chapter. Buoyed by the success at Maria, Mobius began exploring Alexandria's eastern harbor. From the beginning, psychics had indicated sites were to be found there, and perceptions in Egypt reinforced this. To help in their search, Mobius enlisted the aid of one of America's best-known scientists, Professor Harold Edgerton of MIT, inventor of side-scan sonar. From the first, the murky water made it difficult to get clear readings from the sonar. More and more, we had to rely on psychic guidance. 
Helping in the search were navigators and divers from the Egyptian Navy. Many of the perceptions concentrated where the Timonium, Mark Anthony's palace, should be. There, the first dive revealed a jumble of columns, indicating a major structure that had once been above water. Uh, what you've got are a substantial number of pillars that have columns that go like this. Mobius reported their finds to the archaeological consultants, including University Chairman of Classical Studies, Mustafa El Abedi. Size are the broken pieces. There are about 20 pieces. This is the first evidence the scientific world has had from this location. Timonion. Do you think it might be the Timonion? And just Probably, shoot. yes. Just fly if this is a front, front of a building, yes. I would say it was the facade of a building which had pillars along one side. Next, they turned to an area of interest to several psychics, who had all indicated it on the map. George called it Cleo's Palace. Compared with the Timonium, there wasn't much remaining to be seen in the palace complex above the seafloor. But the idea that Anthony and Cleopatra had lived there and loved there was an extraordinary experience for all of us, Egyptians and Americans alike. Another psychic target was the lighthouse at Pharos, the tallest building in antiquity. This surviving toy or souvenir gives only a hint of its majesty. These are the first films that have ever been shot at this site. And we now believe that these huge granite blocks are made up of the lighthouse and a temple that lay nearby. Seeing those enormous statues and sphinxes really showed me how sophisticated the ancient builders were. And on our last diving day, we found these strange bead-like objects that George had told us to look for. But our most important find was nothing but a simple wall, and that impressed Mikulowski Rajevich most of all. This is a very important uh, uh, discovery because it extends the map of ancient Alexandria much more to the north, uh, to the part which is covered now with water. I would like, as an archaeologist, uh, classify this uh, discovery as much more important uh, as the Temple of Alexander the Great because it extends our general knowledge about the, one of the most important towns of ancient world. With the success in the harbor, the work Mobius had planned was over. It would take years of research to finally evaluate, but the groundwork had been laid. However, Egypt and the secrets it revealed through extraordinary means were not quite through with the Alexandria project. Weeks before, prior to describing the tomb of Alexander at Nebi Daniel Mosque, McMullen had begun to talk about Alexander's body in the years soon after his death. It came mostly in snatches of conversation while driving to and from formal experiments. An odd story caught on a cheap tape recorder in the car. This condition had deteriorated considerably. George told Schwartz that as the body deteriorated, dye from the burial clothes had stained Alexander's bones a reddish blue. A reddish blue. Uh, it turned almost a chocolate color. What finally happened to the reddish bones? McMullen said simply they had been taken into the desert centuries later by people who were not Islamic. I never knew what to make of that story. George chewed on it over the weeks, but there was just no way I could see to check it out. It was one of those things that just sort of got filed. Midway between Alexandria and Cairo lies the oldest Christian community in Egypt, the Coptic Monastery of St. Macarius. After completing their work in Alexandria, the Mobius filmmakers arrived there to begin a documentary for another film company. For over 80 generations, older monks have passed down the tradition that buried somewhere on the grounds were the bones of St. John the Baptist. Ancient Coptic sources held accounts of the bones being brought from the Holy Land first to Alexandria and then to the monastery. But although the texts were clear about the bones' arrival, their final resting place had been lost until the late 1970s, until the restoration of a chapel linked by tradition with the burial. A crypt was found containing the bones of perhaps as many as 12 people. At first, it was a fascinating story of another chance discovery in archaeology. The monks had found in the texts that the bones had been buried beneath an ancient church that once stood on the site of Nebi Daniel Mosque. Was there anything unusual about the bones? The reply? Nothing unusual, really, except some of them bore reddish stains. 
We may never know if these are actually the bones of Alexander. The monks won't even let them be photographed. But when I think of the cistern and the location of the alleyway from Los Angeles, and the wall behind the wall, and the location at Maria, and the column, and the tiles, as well as those finds in the Eastern Harbor, I think it would be very foolish to dismiss the story of the red stained bones. We're not very far in understanding how to use the psychic side of the human mind about where the Wright brothers were when they were flying. But that shouldn't hold us back from this kind of exploration.